Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Today, I felt inspired by the Spirit of God to talk about the anointing of association. The Bible has several examples, several examples of the power of association. And... It's an indelible fact in the faith that the anointing is transferable through association because there are patterns to the anointing. And when I say patterns to the anointing, it is one thing to increase the anointing of God in your life. It's another to increase in the anointing of God upon your life. I mean to say, it's one thing to learn to increase the anointing functioning on your life through your gifting, your calling, your assignment and mandate. That's one thing. But it's another for you, the individual, to increase while the anointing of God is on your life. I hope that's clearer. So we have people who know how to increase the anointing operating on their lives. But as individuals, they're not growing spiritually to equal the measure of the increase of the anointing on their lives. So you find somebody who can open a blind eye, you know, can do a very, very great act or mighty work in the spirit, but he's not or she is not mature in the things of the spirit. God wants us to grow these two together. That as the anointing operating on your life increases, you increase, you mature yourself as an individual in understanding. Because not all instructions are the same. Some instructions come for your maturation. Some instructions come for the increase of what's upon your life. And these two are different. But in the Bible, there's various examples in Scripture that spell God transferring, increasing, extending anointings by association. Well, let me begin with First Samuel, the 10th chapter, from about the 5th verse. We see Saul anointed by Samuel, and he's to be king for Israel. Later on, as we see the story. But we see a definitive instruction here in the 5th verse. As uh, Samuel is speaking to Saul... He's telling him, after that, thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass, when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with psaltery and tabret and the pipe and the harp before them, and they shall prophesy. In fact, there are definitions of certain instruments in the prophetic. And I've taken time to study some of which. And if you are a student of the word, take time and study the pipe, the harp, the trumpet, and all these things. It's interesting, the voices they give in the prophetic realm. And the Bible says in the sixth verse, and the spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. This is now Samuel speaking to Saul. The spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with the prophets you will meet, and shall be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serves thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I'll come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and sacrifices and sacrifices of peace, etc., etc. And verses 9, and it was so that when he had turned his back from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. And when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him, Saul, and the Spirit of God came upon him, and the Bible says, and he prophesied among them. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw, behold, he prophesied among the prophets. Then the people said to one another, what is it that is come to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? 
Has he become a prophet? He's prophesying. He's prophesying. So we see a man who, by order and design, was not called in the office of a prophet. We see the anointing functioning on the life of Saul as a king. But by the word of a prophet, Samuel, he tells him, you're going to meet a group of prophets on the road. And when you meet them, the spirit operating of the prophetic will come upon you. And you shall be turned into another man. And you shall prophesy also with them. And whatever occasion is suitable for you, do for the Lord is with you. Wow, there's a liberty there. Let me first spell this very clearly. When the man of God tells Saul that when you are turned into another man and you enter into the prophetic, he tells him that whatsoever things occasion serve for you, he says, do for God is with you. He's telling him that when you're invited into certain graces, you have liberties that appeal to your will individually. Why? Because at that particular point, you're not carried with your own will. There's an underlying power that has propelled you. There's an underlying power that has compelled you. There is an underlying power that has carried you into that space, into particular graces. Now, he's speaking about the liberties of the Spirit. And as a child of the anointing, you need to learn when you enter the spaces of the liberties of the Spirit when occasion serves you. That is the reason why we teach the wisdom of God, soonesis and phronesis. The critical faculty, soonesis, phronesis, defining the mode of action because you behold the end in sight. That is a liberty in the spirit. When we are talking about phronesis, the wisdom that causes you to choose the way you want the miracle to happen, we're talking about such liberties. So he's telling Saul that when you sit in the company of these prophets, the Spirit of God will come upon you, and you shall be turned into another man. And that man will have a full function of phronesis on his life. And he says, and whatsoever occasion serves you, do for God is with you. Of this sense, that he has taken a hold of your heart, that there is no occasion you will choose to serve, even though you're conscious that you're serving it, will be of you. Remember, it is the trust of the Spirit toward your soul or your spirit in its leaning, in its yielding entirely to God's personality that invites you into that freedom. Wherewith you worry not that you will choose a way and the Spirit of the Lord will not perform in that manner. It's not possible. So why it's difficult to understand is because many people live in a carnal realm. Many people have not tested that realm. So it's hard to design it when you have not tested it. It's hard to design it when you've not been invited into it. But for any man or woman who has been invited into it, the one thing that defines you in that realm is the purity of spirit. The Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. That pure heart, the purity of spirit, as God has done and worked in your life, when it invites you into that occasion, it's amazing that the things you will speak even to think they'll carry a purity. So you find that in the highest realms of our liberties is also the highest realm of our yieldedness toward God. So I'm dead, yet I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who gave himself for me. I'm dead, but yet I live, yet not I. You see what Paul is saying? But Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. So when this man is walking, what do they see? They see Paul. But he's no longer conscious of himself as of anything to himself. And that is why he does not even submit himself to the judgments of men. And why? Not because he is a rebellious fellow. Not because he's proud and he thinks he's above all of them. No. But because he is conscious of the realm in which he has been invited. That he cannot do anything save that which Christ has wrought in him. Save that which Christ has wrought by him. It's a place of maturity. It's a place of liberty. Not many people have the grace in this life to enter or walk into. And not that it's not available to all, but the sons of men are not so available to God as to exercise themselves in such ways. God has given us such a liberty in the spirit realm. It only takes a man of understanding to know how to deal with his liberties. And so we see a form of phronesis that is given to the man who has been invited in a certain level and realm of association. 
He's carried by the grace of the words that have been given by Samuel the prophet. And so we see a man who is not prophesying because he is a prophet. But we see a man who is prophesying because he is in the realm of prophets. And that is why when the people saw and knew that Saul is not a prophet, but he is prophesying, there was a distinction that was drawn in the prophetic because this kind of distinction was only impartational. The people of that time knew that this fellow can only move in the prophetic if he's not a prophet by some sort of impartation. So, the people now are inquiring, what manner of impartation is this? That is why, in the 12th verse, again, of 1 Samuel 10, he says, And one of the same place answered and said, But who is their father? He says, Therefore, it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? But remember, the guy among them is asking, Who is their father? Why? Because the people who are beholding this, they do not know actually how or where this instruction began. So, what they see is a group of prophets that are appearing with psaltery and harps and all these kinds of things. And a certain fellow, whom they are sure is not a prophet, comes and joins them and he starts prophesying. And this people like, who is their father? In other words, which spirit taught them how to impart the prophetic on a man which is not a prophet? Why? Because now they know that if they can go and connect to the fathering spirit of these prophets they would be able to connect to realms which they are not originally called for. These were lasting men. Could be even hungry. But I don't think that they'll get the answer. Because the prophetic on Saul is not because he associated with the prophets on the streets, but because also he associated with the anointing on Samuel, which was prophetic. So, that which he finds on the streets is secondary. If Saul had not met Samuel, perhaps the story would have been different. And anything under Samuel could have been instructed and it would walk in that grace because of the authority that Samuel commanded in the spirit. Remember, he was above the kingly. He was above the kingly. He anointed the king. You see, so there was something distinctive about him. Because, again, if you go back in the days of Samuel, when revelation was scarce, visions were scarce, men could not access the purity of the revelation of God as it ought. This one fellow had God. The Bible says that Samuel had God at Shiloh. The voice of God was clear to that man in that dispensation when it was close to every man in that dispensation, it is possible for a few people to hear God distinctively. For a few people to hear God differently from many of the average people of the hour. Not everybody hears God the same way. Not everybody hears God the same way. So you see, there was something about Samuel. There was something about Saul associating with Samuel, coming in contact with the prophets that stirred him into functioning in the prophetic anointing, albeit he was not a prophet. That is the power of association. It can invite you into graces of which you were not originally called and designed for to serve a bigger purpose of God in God for the fulfillment of his plan. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The scriptures tell us of a man called David. When God was preparing David after Saul to become king, David needed the mightiest army that he could ever have. But the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 22 verses 2, the Bible says he went to collect a group of people. And the Bible says, one, he collected every man that was in distress, and he collected every man that was in debt, and he collected everyone that was discontented, and he gathered them together unto him and became a captain over them. And there with him were 400 men. And God gets men which are disgruntled, discontent, in debt, distressed, confused, perplexed. Gets them together and builds an army out of them. It was not in their own ability to become better than the spaces they had found themselves into. Than the circumstances that they find themselves evolving into. 
But when they come in contact with a man with the heart of God, with a man with whom God has a particular plan and a calling, they are all changed into the mightiest army we have read in human history. Why? Because they come in contact with the right anointing. The anointing of association can lift you out of even the biggest trouble that you're in. Because you're tagged to someone with a destiny. Lot would have been an average man if he had stayed with terror. But the Bible says, but when God calls Abraham, the Bible says, Lot went with him also. And the scripture says, and when Abraham prospered, Lot prospered also. God did not have a covenant with Lot. But Lot connected to a man whom God had blessed. When you understand the ways of God, you are careful with the people that you associate with. You are careful with the friends that you make. You're careful with the people that you give reference of or to. You're careful with the people that you build conversations with and relationships with. Because one person can come in your life and destroy your destiny. It's possible. It's possible. We know the story of the young prophet and the older prophet. God has given this young prophet a story telling him, you know what? Go this way. You should not stop on the way. You should not eat from any house and da, da, da. The scriptures tell us an older prophet calls the fellow. He had heard of the fame of this young prophet. During that time, the star of the young prophet was becoming brighter as the star of the old prophet perhaps was dimming. So he could see by the spirit that there was something working on this boy that was bigger. Otherwise, how would he then catch the attention? How would he be taken to attend to a young man passing through a city except that the reputation of this young man had gone before him and that this old prophet had recognized that there was something that was being elevated. There was a star that was becoming brighter and brighter than the star that he was of that particular hour. And then he invites him into his own household. But, oh, the young prophet says, you know, I cannot go that way because the Lord instructed me not to stop by, not to eat anything. But the old prophet tells him, but I'm also a prophet also. So we see a young man giving into the delusion that because the older prophet is instructing, therefore, the original instruction of God has to be cancelled to honor the older prophet. That association killed the destiny of a young man. That association killed the destiny of a young man. Unfortunately, in our dispensation, we usually give that example, usually generational gaps. So the younger preachers are the young prophets and the older preachers are the old prophets because some people only think it's that, no, it's not that shallow. It's deeper than that. If you go deeper, you realize that that young old in the New Testament dispensation is the new wine and the old. And the wine skin which is new and the wine skin which is old. And if you understand the way of the spirit, a prophet is not old because they've been prophesying for 30 years. And a prophet is not young because they've been prophesying for two years. No. A prophet in the New Testament dispensation is not old only because he has made 50 years in the prophetic, although there is a space in the spirit where we respect ancient anointings. But there are people who have been prophets for 50 years, but they last really connected with God 20 years ago. And there are prophets who have been prophets for the last 10 years only. But of all of those 10 years, they have been in tune with the Spirit of God for the hour of that time. That comes with the newness of the Spirit. So it doesn't matter whether you've been a prophet for 60 years. If you last had God 30 years ago, there's something old about you. And again, you could find an equal measure of a prophet who has also been in equal years of prophecy of 60 years, but he has been hearing God for the past 60 years. That man has a newness, even though his body is old. Because when we are talking about age, when it comes to spirits, it's different from the age as we account it in the physical form. Hallelujah, glory to God. But anyway, we see that the destiny of a young man was destroyed because he went the way of association that he was not supposed to associate. We see these people that David carried we see them coming from everywhere in their distress, in their confusion. But there is an anointing that can make them straight. There is an anointing that can restore them to sanity. There is an anointing that can give them a purpose and redefine a destiny because they've come in the right contact. They've come in the right contact. 
And then we see that all through scripture, Sarah was a barren woman. But she was married to a man whom God had given a covenant that his descendants shall be as the stars of heaven. There was no way she would die a barren woman because the man she had married had a covenant with God. Isaac marries Rebekah. She has her issues too, but he has a covenant with God. Jacob, Leah, and Rachel struggled to give birth, but he was a man under a covenant. You've read of the Shunammite woman coming in contact with the prophet. You've heard of Laban and Jacob. He says, for depart not from me. Laban telling Jacob when Jacob now wants to leave. He says, depart not from me, for I have learned of a truth that God has prospered me because of you. And sometimes the people that God uses for your elevation and growth in the spaces of association, they do not necessarily need to be higher than you. They might be lower than you, but it takes a great wisdom to know the difference. It takes a great wisdom to know the difference. We see Jesus in Matthew, the fourth chapter, the 18th verse. We see Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee. And he sees two brothers, Simon, Peter, and uh, Andrew. They're casting nets to the sea. And as they were fishers, the Bible says, he said unto them, follow me and I will make you. Follow me and I will make you. I will make you. Just learn to follow. I will make you fishers of men. That's a power of association that you are made by what you follow. You're made by who you follow. That's why I advise you, don't follow everything. Don't follow everybody. Because you'll have a mixture of seed in your spirit. And every time there's a mixture of seed, you create rebellion even without knowing it. Know who you learn from and who your teacher is. And pattern yourself straight. You'll be amazed at the things God will do for you. Some people are so mixed up in this conversation. Let's go back to the book of Acts after the death, resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The disciples go preaching everywhere. They're ministering the gospel in the fourth chapter. You know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of that hour have a problem with the apostles doing signs, miracles, and wonders. And they call them, they summon them because they want to deal with them. And the Bible says in the fourth chapter, the 13th verse, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Association is powerful. What is marveling these people? If these men were learned, if these men were exposed, then there would be no problem. But they know these guys are fishermen. They're normal folk. But they're speaking a wisdom. They're speaking a sort of knowledge. They're speaking a certain understanding that cannot come from men which are unlearned. And so it marvels them. And then the Bible says that it comes to their knowledge that these men had been with Jesus. Association. It is the thing that can present you wiser even when you're not qualified for specific invitations and consummations. Why? Because you have associated with the right person. And so we see that what Jesus had for knowledge... Unlearned men have inherited inherently because they have connected with this man. This is a thing that by impartation in your association can give you in one year what a man has paid 20 years to get. This is the thing that out of your association can give you in two years what has taken another man 50 years to get. You just need to know your positioning and position yourself well in the things that can change your life. Somebody shout, Amen. We remember when Paul is dealing with Galatians. You all foolish Galatians who bewitched you. How be it that you began in faith and now you seek perfection through works of the flesh. And in the fifth chapter of Galatians, the seventh verse, he says that you did run well. And he's asking, but who hindered you that you should not obey the truth? The eighth verse says, and this persuasion cometh not from him that calleth you. He says, a little living, living at the whole lamp. He's saying, these guys began well in the life of salvation. They were walking right. And then somehow they encountered some strange minister, some strange teaching, some strange instruction, some strange doctrine. And before we know that, a whole generation lost its course. Paul is saying, who bewitched you and who bewitched them? The one which comes in them with a divergent doctrine. 
from what had been given them by Christ. So he says, a little leaven, if you read the Amplified from the ninth verse, he says, a slight inclination to error or a few false teachers leavens the whole lamp of it. It perverts the whole conception of faith and misleads the whole church. Some of you, you want to watch every preacher on Facebook. You want to watch every teacher on Facebook. You want to read every pastor. You want to listen to everything that is Christian. But you see, it takes a little error that is off, that is even beyond your discernment, because by the time you get there to watch certain people, you already cannot discern. It takes a little seed planted in your spirit, and it perverts your whole conception of faith. Amplified is the word conception. The power of conception in faith. That a little doctrine can frustrate your power to conceive seed. So when the Bible says, by faith, Sarah received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who promised. The power to bring results is subject to the power of how much we're able to conceive the word. And just a misdirection of scripture, small little error can kill your faith. Some of you, you're not struggling because... God has not spoken, but you're struggling because you have mixed seeds in you and your conception of faith is dead. Your conception of faith is misleading or it's misled. Your conception of faith is frustrated because the way you see God is a mixture of two seeds or three or four or 20 of them that were planted in your life concerning the same doctrine. Because instructions are spiritual and so we receive impartations and instructions from spirits, not just the articulation of vocabulary and language. Some people have the language, but they don't carry the spiritual authority to instruct. And that is why there are certain people who are good preachers, but they cannot, they cannot produce the results of the message that they profess because they don't carry the equal measure of the authority that comes with the justification of the Spirit, the vindication of God. The Bible calls that the great mystery, the mystery of godliness, when you understand that. The mystery of godliness is the justifier of the authorities with which we function to allow us to be able to manifest the things that we so assume that are true with us and that we have in Christ. If a minister has not understood the greatness of that mystery, yet Paul calls it a great mystery. The greatness of that mystery. He'll be the kind who can preach a very good sermon, but cannot build a mean mystery. Can counsel every couple to reconciliation, but will not be able to run his own house. Far from you in the name of Jesus. I said far from you in the name of Jesus. Now, there are two realities that I want to define for you in this whole understanding of the anointing of association. There are people who are born a certain way with certain abilities, certain potentials, certain consummations, certain skills, certain masteries. The word there is the innate, innately. That thing with which you have, but you don't have it because you were conditioned into it or you learned it. Those are the ones that I call the innate. That the people who, for example, if somebody is born a musician, if somebody can sing, they were born with the ability to sing, they can sing. Whether you take them for voice training or not, if somebody was born to sing, they don't need voice training because it's in them to sing. They don't need to force it. You know, there are people, of course, who say, ah, I want somebody to teach me to sing. You can only teach one to sing which cannot sing to a certain degree. But you'll never be as one which is a natural born singer or musician. You see? Because it's innate. It's in them, not out of conditioning and learning. It's in them simply because they were created that way. That's the innate. And then we have another group of people which I want to call the acquired. Right? The people who live in the realm of things that they acquire by learning. 
things they acquire by exercising, things they acquire by relating to the right people, by reading, by getting information, by exercising, by training, and all these kinds of things. I call them the acquired. So when talking about the two realms, when we're defining the anointing of association, you must understand the things that you will acquire in this life because you are not innately born with them, and the things that are innate with you because they were originally given to you. You see? You must understand those two things. The innate things and the acquired things. The innate and the acquired. You need to understand how that works. Let me give you the picture so you understand what I mean. If you were born with a certain ability, again, let me use the example of singing. If you are to associate or if you are to be invited in the space of association, you'd best benefit from one with the innate ability than it is with one which has acquired skill. Because there are spaces in their training, they acquired in their training for you that they can never reach. Why? Because they carry the information of a thing that they can never feel after. Because it's not in them. You see? It's not in them. It's not in them. They're not going to force it into them. Yet it's okay for one which is acquiring to be instructed by one which is acquiring because they share experiences. They share the realm. Why? Because the one which is just trying to acquire something, if he meets one which also earned this thing through acquiring it, through working hard for it, through you know, training, exercising, and all these kinds of things, to acquire themselves into that thing. It's easier for them to, ins to instruct that which also comes into that space to acquire what they were not really born with. Of course, the world has proved clearly that there are certain things that we can acquire and even supersede those that were born with these things. Supersede the innately gifted. It's possible. It's possible. Why? Because the way of master is clear. The patterns of mastery are clear. Exercise is exercise. Training is training. The repetitive doing of a thing can invite somebody into certain places of mastery. But not all things can be done in the realm of the acquired. Yet all things can be done in the realm of the innate. Why? Because there is an extended hand of God that is beyond human effort. There is an extended hand of God that is beyond human effort. In Proverbs, the 21st chapter, the 20th verse, the Bible says that there is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. But it says, but a foolish man spendeth it up. Listen, listen. That when you are around a man which is wise, there is treasure to be desired. There is oil. There is a sort of anointing that is around wise men. It's just there. It's present with them. They don't need to dispel it. They don't even need to speak it. If a man, if a woman is wise, they have a certain anointing that lingers around them. All right? And so, if you're invited in that dwelling, it's bound to extend on you. That's why the Bible says that he that walketh with the wise, Proverbs 13, verses 20, becomes wise. If you walk with the wise, you shall be wise. If you walk with the wise... If you walk with the wise, the Hebrew word there for walk is haula, which means if you behave yourself with the wise. If you behave yourself like the wise, that means you take time to observe them which are wise and then you behave yourself like they do. Sometimes you might not even have the full apprehension of why they do what they do. But if what they do, you design in your spirit is not evil, it's not on the side of darkness, even before you understand it, imitate it you'll be amazed at what God will do in your life. It takes too much pride not to imitate what God has invited in your space for instruction. So when he says how luck, it means behave yourself like the wise. When you see how they behave, it also means exercise yourself as the wise exercise themselves. How luck. For example, if you know that the wealthiest people have a certain life they live, for example, the biggest percentage of people that I know are wealthy. There's a way they have a routine, a daily routine. 
Every wealthy man that I know has a routine on their lives. They have a daily routine. And in that routine, there are certain disciplines that justify their blessing. Every wealthy man that I know, if you look into their daily routine, those which have actually made wealth the right way, with the right people, in the right patterns, and have actually earned it, merit. If you look at their daily routine, they have certain disciplines in those routines that justify the reason of their success. For example, majority of the richest men in the world I know are readers. Bill Gates is a great reader. Warren Buffett is a great reader. Jack Ma is a great reader. Jeff Bezos is a great reader. Elon Musk is a great reader. And the many are like. So if you know that that's a pattern, for any man which is wealthy, how can you spend a whole year, a whole year, 12 months of a year, and you can't even read three pages of a book? What's wrong with you? And then you take your head in the praise of God and say, Father, you said wealth. <laughs> Speak all you want. Claim all the scriptures all you want. It will be true that you are blessed. It will be true that he became poor, that you might become rich. But because he did, it doesn't mean that there are no principles to appropriate the manifestation of what we're already given in Christ Jesus. Are you going to confess negatively even though you were given divine health and then you think you're going to live no more? No, you will die. Even though God died for your sins, Jesus shed his blood for you and he was wounded for your transgressions and by his stripes you were healed, even though it's available for your healing. If you do not know how to believe God and how to confess right, you will die. Yet, divine health is available for you in Scripture. It's the same thing. Right? So he say, exercise yourself like the wise. Exercise yourself, how luck. But also the other word means to follow, like when Jesus says, follow me. The other word is relate continually with the wise. Relate continually. In other words, when you see somebody who is graced in the area that you admire and you know that it is pure in its earning, pay every price to relate with them continually. Some spaces of impartation cannot be used only for reference. You have to build a deliberate plan to relate further than just reference. It's not just enough to say, oh, let me check what she preached or what he preached today or what he's doing. Let me just fall and see what he's doing and watch from afar. Some of them, some impartations require certain relationships. Why? Because they invite you in the space where certain words will be pronounced over your life that should change your destiny. That should change your destiny. So let's go back here in Proverbs 21, 20. He said, in the dwelling of a wise man is treasure. It's treasure in the dwelling of the wise. And oil is a certain anointing. Whether you're talking about wise financially, wise in ministry, wise maritally, wise in every aspect, in whichever wisdom you want, your spelling, that could ever exist between your spaces of interpretation, within your scope of understanding. He says, every wisdom you admire on a man, that man carries a particular treasure, source of it, and a certain anointing for it. But he says, but a fool spendeth it up, meaning it's possible for great treasure and oil to dwell in the heart of a fool. Why? Because they too are exposed in the spaces of the wise. It's possible. It's possible. Let me explain what I mean by that. You can find a person who has learned to live or relate, or by reason of life, they found themselves in the spaces of a man who imparted something on their lives. All right? And then they learn the art and the skill and the craft of our thing. But then certain areas in their lives are incomplete in the way of life. And that's the space of the foolishness that we're talking about. And because of that, they blow up even what they got from one realm of wisdom. And I'm trying to say that when we are talking about wisdom, seek all wisdom. Seek all wisdom. Seek the perfection of God in every angle of your life when you're learning. Because it's one thing to be successful in marriage, 
but failing in business. It's one thing to be successful in business, but failing in ministry. You need success 360. 360. 360. So why does it talk about the fool which spends it? He's trying to say that even though you were born with certain abilities and you can be invited to certain abilities, there are also certain things that you must acquire in life. The eunuch is born eunuch, but he's also made eunuch by men. And he can also separate himself as eunuch for the kingdom's sake. The efforts as an individual to become great in a thing are accepted. But also the efforts of those God will send before you to undergird you, to train you, to equip you, to impart into you, to instruct you are relevant. But yet that which you were born with also is important. Those three are important. That I am born with something. But what are those things I'm not born with and I need to acquire by instruction and certain individuals? And what are those things that without the individuals I can do of my own self? All of those things are key. But if you're talking about the middle one, by men, we're talking about association. You cannot run away from it. Read church history. We don't know much of West Africa, except witchcraft and death and all these matter of things. Until one great man rises from Benin, and man bends on in Dahosa. We know that he's the father, actually, of the faith of Nigeria, as we know it. And you cannot doubt that the church in Nigeria is at another level. I'm not saying that there are no weaknesses. There are weaknesses everywhere. You know, there are weaknesses in all the ministries. If you want to look for them, you can find them. But we've seen the work that he has done in the David Oyedepo's and the rest of them. We can see a very clear trail. But Bertrand in Dahosa, in his own words, he says that Dr. T. L. Osborne and his wife, Daisy, are the greatest blessing that ever happened to the continent of Africa. And he says, whatever I am, in his own words, he says, whatever I am, they made me so. They made me so. So it doesn't mean that he was not anointed by God. But he came in contact with a certain couple that made him bigger than he could have been as an individual. And we know what that man, T.L. Osborne, and his wife were to this nation, Uganda. Kenneth Copeland tells you, T.L. Osborne, we have a man like uh, Kenneth E. Hagen. How many men in history can actually say, that man taught us faith? Multitudes. Because they are associated with the right one. The man of God, David Oedipo, says in his own story, he entered his office, the office of Kenneth E. Hagen, the man of God, and he told him, I want that which is in you that makes you who you are. And he tells him, kneel down, and he spoke an impartation on that man's life. And we've seen what our father Deboy has become on this continent. Nobody can doubt that he is a father to the continent. Why? The right association. The right association. Now I can speak for the sake of the gospel. I can speak for the sake of the gospel. What? Some of them were multi-gifted. We see that Aliko Dangote, the story, one of the wealthiest men in Africa, he gave space in a flight to Tia Osborne and his wife at the request of Benton in Dahosa. And he speaks a blessing over him and he tells him, you'll be the richest fellow in Africa. And he was. Why? Because in that seat, he agreed to serve an anointing that was above him. We will not know Valiko's faith, but what we know is he came in contact with a man who heaven could hear when he spoke a word. And a man's destiny was changed. Now, it doesn't matter how much Don Cote will work, there's something spiritual that connects him to the wealth of this continent. And it came because he served a certain group of people. Look at church history. Follow it all through and you'll see these associations are clear. If you are not born with it, acquire it. If you are called to acquire it, pay the price of it. If you are born with it, look for one who was born with it and connect to him. You'll be amazed at the things God will do in your life. You'll be amazed at the things God will do in your life. You will be amazed. That is how we grow. 
from my mother's womb, I was anointed by God. I know it. I was sealed in instruction. God spoke to her. I knew it since I was a child that I was anointed by God. But also, there are people in this life whose graces I have had to connect to because I knew that they would invite me in spaces perhaps I might have not heard because that's how God works. He has not made us to not need anyone. Even Jesus needed the words of Simeon on his life. A prophet holds him in his hands and speaks into. He needed a John to baptize him. Yet he was 100% the son of God. That's just the way of the spirit. That's just the way of the spirit. You cannot run away from him. And so you can either build destiny and life with the right associations. God has guaranteed that the oil on them can easily come. Know how to invite certain graces in your life. Know how to serve graces. That's why I tell people, you don't submit to age. You don't submit to money. You don't submit to books. You submit to graces. You submit to graces. You submit to graces. Because those are the things that you're invited into. Those are the things that will make you these are things that will make you. And you pray that you don't carry a foolish heart when you're around the great. You pray that you never carry any form of foolishness when you're around the anointed of God. Because if you do, the Bible says, you will spend and spoil. You'll waste in the spirit. you learn. You'll spend it up. You'll waste it. It will not benefit you. You'll worry it out and grieve it. You'll provoke it even against you to judge you. Know how to deal with the right associations. Disconnect from the associations that don't build you. Pay the price of disconnecting to anything that does not advance you. Because when you become born again, when you aspire for mastery, skills, consummations, potentials that are bigger than you and you know that you're called for some greater, you define your associations deliberately. You define your associations exclusively. You define your associations explicitly. You define them. Define who you associate with. Don't associate with everybody. And now I pray for you in the mighty name of Jesus. That may God, and I pray as I hope that you're speaking in tongues too, that may God, cause the right people to come to you. May God open the right doors of people to come to you. May God send you men and women of the right influence. May God send you men and women of the right skill. May God send you men and women of the right masteries. May God send you men and women who will understand what is upon you and will only seek to build it and not to destroy it. May God keep away people that are not called for your destiny. It doesn't matter how close you are as friends. May God give you a vision to understand that he's calling for you and relationship with you is bigger than any relationship you will ever have on the earth. And for those that you might not know, but are for your destruction and for your falling. In the name of Jesus Christ, I command situations and circumstantial evidences that will separate you from them in the name of Jesus Christ. And may God, as they leave, replace them with men which will be ten times more beneficial. Ten times more influential. Ten times more wiser. Ten times more committed. Ten times more. And, and hundreds of times way more aligned to the will and course of your destiny. May you have the right men to usher you into your next level of ministry. May you have the right midwives around you to help you bring forth that which God created in your life to bring forth. May God separate you from any seed that is not of God, that is corruptible, any seed that is of war and hate, any seed that is of contention and frustration, any seed that is of laxity and regression, any seed of slow progress and detrimental 
I decree and declare that it shall not come near you in the name of Jesus. I decree and I declare that this is your season of advancement. This is a season of going forward. This is a season of increase. This is a season of multiplication. This is a season of separation. This is a season of consecration. This is a season of your consummation. This is a season where God wants to empower you. This is a season where God wants to multiply you. This is a season where God wants to increase you. This is a season where God has to take you to your next level of faith, to your next level of prayer, to your next level of signs, miracles, and wonders, to your next level of wealth, to your next level of relationships, to your next level of wisdom, to your next level of understanding, to your next level of networking, to your next level of relationship. In the mighty name of Jesus, may God cause you to associate even for those you thought you'd never have access to. May God open doors to access the people you need for your elevation. May God open doors to access the people that you need to associate with for your increase, for your growth. In the mighty name of Jesus, I decree and I declare that the things that were born in you will meet men which were born with the same and those men will propel you to the right things. And with the things that you shall acquire, God shall send men which have acquired the right way also to train you in those things. And if that happens in your life, I am certain that your future is a success. I am certain that your future is blessed. I am certain that your story is going upward. I'm certain that your narration will be bright. In the mighty name of Jesus. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Wherever you are, thank God for what he is doing, for what he has done. And what he is going to do. In Jesus' mighty name. And all saints said, Amen. Glory to God. If you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior simple you say these words with me because now is the time not tomorrow now is the time I still don't know why you associated with this ministry why you're tuning in God wants to give you an open invitation and I want you to say Lord Jesus I thank you because you shed your blood for my sins and was raised for my glory tonight I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.